Let's talk about Hell's Kitchen. I don't know. You're just kind of revved up because you're like, no yeah. one knows, but you're coming off of like hanging out with Gordon Ramsay for a month or a little bit more. Well, welcome to another episode of Culinary 360. I'm Chef Luke. I'm Chef Ryan. And I'm Chef Robert. And today we're really excited to have a friend of mine on this podcast. I've known Chef Adam for over 10 years. I first met him following him on social media in Milwaukee, and I really liked the food that I was seeing coming out of his kitchens. Adam is the chef owner of Egg Flour in Bayview, Wisconsin. There's been a few incarnations of Egg Flour over the years, um, starting out in a food hall and now as a brick and mortar. You know, Adam's got a great setup going on. He's really taught his staff how to run that restaurant well, so that it frees him up for doing private events and caterings and things like that. But he's also really well known not just for social media presence, but he's been um, on Beat Bobby Flay, season 19 of Hell's Kitchen. Uh, he's been voted 40 under 40 and the Shepherd Express, which is a uh, Milwaukee weekly. Uh, he's been nominated as best chef many, many times. So with that being said, take it away, Adam. <laughs> so when did you get Alfredo? Uh, last mm. night at six o'clock. Oh shit, that oh, early. Wow, wow. Just that's awesome. He's new as shit right now. Has no idea yeah. what's going on. <laughs> can we can we is the little one in your in your hands? Can we see? Oh, uh, look at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> look, look into the camera. Up here. Up here. This is your big debut. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> here, look, 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 look. Oh, oh. There you go. <laughs> oh, right in there. Oh, there. There we go. Oh, we broke perfect. the internet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I told the whole Facebook last night that I got him and he had 800 likes and I was like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> he needs his own page. <laughs> yes. You just have to make your own dog page now. <laughs> yeah. Like random people are like, can we like send him toys? Or I'm like, I'm not giving you my address. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> But drop them off at the restaurant. We'll just have a pop box there. Yeah. There you He's go. the new mascot yep. for the restaurant for sure. We're going to, his name's Alfredo. So we want to do like a table full of pasta and then just like plop them in there and just like rip a bunch of pictures and see how it does until he starts <laughs> eating it. Oh, that's. <laughs> that would be, be awesome. awesome. That would be really <laughs> rad. And he's. Biting the Massimo Patura book right now. It's a good one. <laughs> He's got good taste at least, right? Yeah. <laughs> I have that exact same Bob Burgers photo in my apartment. Yeah, the floating burgers. I have it in my wall too. I, love, I love Bob's Burgers. You got to show the love to the burger. Yes, you do. There nice. You go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm the complete opposite of Robert with tattoos and hair. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's kind of kind of bizarre when we'd go to um, charity events or we'd run into each other at other things, and it's like, yeah, it's you know, I I, I look so straight. <laughs> Just so you guys know, uh, Adam and I met many years ago when I was kicking around Milwaukee, and Adam was chef at many different restaurants around town, and I just stumbled across, I think it was Instagram or it was Facebook, and just was digging the food that I was seeing and um, ended up going into the restaurant and meeting him. And we found out we had some common friends around town and we'd run into each other at charity events and things like that. Did you show them our video that you were in for the, oh. the Chef Collaboration video? We should show them or if you guys could pull that up. It was like the second one we did. Yeah, it was probably 18 yeah, but what I, I do it every year, we have different chefs come in everywhere from we've done six all the way up to 10. And every chef picks a charity that they want to represent. So it's not like, oh, hey, just like I'll cook for my charity that you have no connection to. And then uh, they all do a course and we do pairings. And then um, but Robert was a part of that. So I think that was a big thing that brought us together, too. That's cool. He was the only chef doing something where no one knew what the food was. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a remember that right because i got i got thrown on vegetable yes i did smoked uh red and yellow beets and uh -huh. i had um some sort of you know this is back kind of molecular days um i had like a brown butter 
uh, snow on there and some sort of um, beet and yogurt gel thing or something. And, yeah. Yeah. And the next guy's like, here, here's a piece of steak. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that sounds about right. I feel like sometimes those collaboration dinners, I mean, there's, there's a pretty wide array of what people are actually executing. Yeah. And that was a thing where like we had, we don't really, I don't really put a theme on it. Cause I'm like, everyone's so different and there's no rules. And it's like, Hey, the only thing that we really do is give them like what to do for that course. So at least it makes some sense, uh-huh. but progression at these things are a little difficult. Cause it's like, you don't want to tell a chef like, no, that dish yeah, right? is not going to work. <laughs> when we just make sure that we're not repeating the same uh, ingredients, you know, a lot or whatever, but really good over the last we've done five now and we've probably raised over two hundred fifty thousand dollars between the five dinners that's awesome that's, that's so awesome. amazing that's, that's so awesome. Rad. you want to fly in and do another one get the ignite, ignite team to do a course Ooh. oh that'd be fun. That'd be yeah yeah i'm down that sounds well, awesome yeah yeah right that'd now fun. Well, how we do it is i kind of like look for a venue first or and then mm-hmm. you know grab the date and then i just send out to like 50 chefs in the first eight that respond, um, get a spot. And then we just, we go from there, but it's really easy. We take care of everything super smooth. Um, usually the venue takes care of a lot of the stuff. So it's nice. It's like show up with your stuff and I'll tell you mm-hmm. what course you're on and that's it. That'd be so much fun. Yeah. And it's a, the big, the big reason I always started is cause I wanted chefs that didn't know each other to get to know each other. Mm-hmm, and like, mm-hmm. that's the only good way. It's like, we're not going to have, no one's going to like go out to a bar and just start mingling. It's like, right. we need to be in the same space. We have the same vision. And it was cool to see chefs that like were in Milwaukee for like both of them, 20 years meeting each other for the first time. They're like, Oh, I know who you are, but I've never met you. And I'm like, Oh, I'm the reason <laughs> you guys met. I'm like your matchmaker. All right, here we go <laughs> for a good see, cause. That's cool. It's like, that's a really cool idea too, because it is really hard to get chefs like to meet each other Mm -hmm. at stuff. I mean, especially when we're doing restaurants and stuff, you're so fucking busy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of chefs like in cities, like the main cities, I, I, I don't know if this is a general statement. It's not quite, but they definitely are more competitive and like have more grudges or hate each other than in Mm -hmm. Milwaukee where it's like, everyone's just like, yeah, just do your thing. And we're pretty civil, but I do know out there, there's a lot of like, you know, chefs that are like not fans of each other. And I'm glad that we don't really right. have that here. Yeah. That's I saw nice. that yeah. some in Chicago when I lived there and worked there. Um, I haven't experienced it here in Phoenix. Everybody, mm-hmm. everybody's, everybody's gone through right. the same kitchens at the same time. And so everybody's, everybody's friendly and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of chill here. Denver, Denver has evolved more into that where the chef community is just very supportive of each other. I mean, you see a lot, a whole lot of collaboration going on, which is really nice. But it it wasn't always like that. It was, yeah. you know, years ago, what, 20 years ago-ish. It was more cutthroat, you know. I don't know too many people in Denver. My my uh, uncle lived in Boulder for a long time, and uh, but never in Denver. When I, I got my first, like, corporate chef job, I, I was a corporate chef for Red Robin, and they're based okay. out of Denver. So that was that was really my first quote unquote restaurant job in Denver. <laughs> is the original Red Robin like super hooked up or is it exactly the same as the other ones? <laughs> yeah. So the, the original one is in Seattle and I think recently, did it recently like get torn down? I think it got torn down. Oh really? They had left it fairly well original <laughs> up until I think that point. And it's pretty neat. We had some of the old signs like, um, the old red bird sign where he's got like a, a cigar. It's not really a cigar. It's a joint and his <laughs> eyes are all bloodshot. We, we had that on the walls at the office. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Just that classic that you don't know with like those special places, like, like chilies or something. Like, are they ripping like in their original location, like ribeyes and like really badass <laughs> food. And then like, all right, let's just serve yeah. chips and salsa at the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah just completely different but or just like way more mainstream but the original one is still just like chef driven and stuff i never got oh, yeah. to do the corporate world the only corporate place i worked at was uh jimmy john's so i'll still walk in there and make uh any sandwich that uh, that they order i could still do them yeah how long did you work there for i worked there for like 
I would say like not even a year. I, it was like in between like taking like work. I've always only worked in a restaurant, but it was in between working at like a decent place and then like a really nice spot. So it was like kind of like a little culinary break, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was moving. I had to go help my dad in, uh, in a place called Shorewood where Robert lived. It was actually that mm-hmm. one on Oakland, Robert. Okay. It was like the busiest Jimmy John's in the Midwest. Yeah. Well, that's because it catered to all, to the school, to the university. Exactly, the college and stuff. But it was just crazy because when you have like the chef background, it's like if one of us walked into a Taco Bell, we would just take it so seriously. It'd be the best damn Taco Bell meals <laughs> yeah. ever. <laughs> like perfect mayo ratio, tomatoes yeah. cut, everything's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Let's just all take over fast food joints and see what we can do with them. <laughs> and see what happens to it. Well, it, there was a thing where chefs were doing elevated fast food. So you had to take, it, I think I think it might have been a charity dinner. And yeah, they just so had it like two made, nights ago in Milwaukee. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, you take McDonald's food and make like fine dining dishes with right. it. Right. There's a chef on Instagram that his um, son makes him do that. Yeah, the Asian guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. He's like, here, make this gourmet. Yeah, it's super rad to watch him do it, too. I got to check that one out. Half half he eaten Domino's pizza, and he's like, make this gourmet. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and it turns out really cool. <laughs> so so let's talk about Hell's Kitchen. I, I, I didn't even know you were on it because, well, I know you had some sort of clause you had to sign, and you kept it really quiet, and nobody knew until, you know, right before they started putting the promos out and all that stuff. Yeah, I actually had to do that for like two years because COVID pushed that back. So I filmed it in 2019, like before I even opened the first restaurant. Okay. And then I came back and opened the restaurant like four days later. Shit. With like, you know, you have some good, um, I don't know, you're just kind of revved up because you're like, no yeah. one knows, but you're coming you're still out. You're like, out with Gordon Ramsay for a month yeah. or a little bit more. And right. no one knew. You just opening the restaurant was like, all right, it doesn't matter about what I just did or filmed or whatever, because no one can know anyways. It's like, we just have to make this great. And then a year went by and they're like, yeah, like, uh, we're getting ready. You know, we'll give you some dates or whatever. And then like four months went by and that's when I started working on my other restaurant, the Bayview location. So we were like up to two and I was open for six days on the brick and mortar like version because my first restaurant was in a food hall. So it was just like mm-hmm. a, a stall that was uh, uh, set up for fast casual. We only had like six or seven menu items real real quick and easy. Um, yeah, but you were making the pasta there and you were doing oh, yeah. everything right in there. So it's not like you were bringing stuff in. No, no, we never did that. We, uh, yeah, we extruded everything and made all the sauces and everything was scratch. We had a big kitchen in the back that everyone shared, which was really nice. But when we opened the brick and mortar, we had so much traction and people were so stoked about it. Cause they're like, yeah, obviously the food hall is cool, but we were dealing with like a, I think it was like a 20 by 30 foot booth. And we were mm-hmm. doing 120 people a day. No problem. So when we opened the, when we were getting ready for the Bayview one, they're like, oh man, like this is going to be your own thing. Some great seating, a bigger menu. You know, we have an open kitchen. It was really, it's really good spot in the heart of Bayview, which is like a really good hip area in Milwaukee. And, uh, six days went by, we crushed it. We did like, I don't know for the whole place is electric by the way, too. No gas. So we were rocking like prep on induction, all that, which we still do to this day. I think we did like 45 grand in six days, the first day, uh, first six days. And, uh, then COVID hit and we had to close. Oh, thank and God. It sucks. And then I got the email being like, yeah, we're not announcing any, uh, any hell's kitchen. It's getting pushed back. And then I had to deal with COVID, the restaurant, and that not coming out all at the same time. And then oh, when COVID was just like really bad, like a year in or so, or maybe a little less than a year in, they're like, all right, we're announcing it. And that's when I started, like, and this is kind of a weird story, but when I was in COVID, we were selling pasta to go because we were just finding any way possible to, like, do something different and get people to like cook at home or whatever they wanted to do. Right. 
And uh, a grocery store, really popular, like high-end, very, very uh, boutique uh, grocery store hit me up and they're like, hey, we want to sell your pasta like in our stores. Like we see that you sell it. It's really cool. I was like, great. So I went into the grocery store and they had like one of those big areas that we all know, like like a deli style, but it was empty and it had like a (laughs) dining room area to it. It had a, a huge hood and gas and walking cooler dish. Everything was built into the space. And I was like, well, I'm kind of on the kick of uh, opening shit when I probably shouldn't be. So let's, uh, let's sit down and talk. And we ended up getting a, a good meeting together. And we ended up opening the third location right in that like high-end grocery store. And that's when we nice. just like really boomed out. And at that same exact time we did that, that's when Hell's Kitchen actually it did, uh, came uh, out. So Robert, sorry thanks. about all that. Cause you're asking just about hell's kitchen, but it was crazy no, that that's, like, that's awesome. All that other that's stuff awesome. happened before we could even announce that it was coming out. So like January, 2021 is when it actually was announced two years of keeping that a secret. And then things just got crazy. And here we are now. That's so cool though. <laughs> yeah. What a good story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just, the, it's just the way that it happened. Like it's like a good thing and bad if COVID never happened. And the, and I opened the second location and just Hell's Kitchen came out. I probably would have never opened that third one just because mm-hmm. we would have never been selling pasta to go or anything like that. But here we are. You can't, you can't yeah. uh, go back on the past, but it all happens for a reason, you know, but Hell's Kitchen was just crazy because I watched it all for entertainment purposes. Obviously, it's like you can't look away. It's like a car accident. You want to watch it. (laughs) Um, And then to finally like have a a chance to go on. And for me, it's like I wasn't going on to get five minutes of fame, like getting in fights and arguments. I don't know if you guys have Luke and Ryan, if you saw the season that I was on, um, Mm -hmm. Robert probably watched. But it was more so like, let's just cook really good food and Mm -hmm. Uh, try to do a little drama like towards the end of the episodes that I was on you could tell I started to like get a little pissed off or get in some like you know arguments or whatever but I'm like I can't get in fights with people I've known for four days right right (laughs) so you don't have that familiarity with them yet yeah and that's why that was a huge reason I think I got I got off because the producers were probably like hey he's doing everything the right way but he's not getting in arguments and there's no drama (laughs) (laughs) which is a huge thing on that show you know obviously the food is the good thing but I went up against uh, you know my elimination was the first time I went up and it was against a guy that's been up for elimination four times and I got taken off. And then the next episode, he's gone. I'm like, oh, you just guys uh, want another. Ep- you want one more episode <laughs> of bullshit. <laughs> That's shitty. But you actually do get to work with him and hang out with him. And he's really, really like fun and inspiring. He wants you to do good. Uh-huh. It's cool when he comes around when you're doing like a challenge or something. And he's like tasting your food. He's like, all right, keep that up. You know, it's like he's not trying to make people look shitty. That right. is not, that, that's easy. That's easy yeah. for yeah. people. <laughs> and people are like, oh, these are supposed to be chefs. It's why can't they just cook whatever? And I'm like, I understand that. But some of the people out there casting, they do a really good job with saying, hey, they're just good enough in the kitchen. But we know that they're going to either fight or argue or right. uh, be very cocky or whatever it is where um, it's it's just for the drama, you know. But that show is super crazy. The back end of it, how they do it, what goes on every day. Um, There's no scripts or anything. It's just, you know, when there's cameras and he's walking around and you have all these weird sets and everything, all these challenges, it just is what it is. Just random shit happens. You you don't, you don't need to script it. Yeah. Well, like Luke always says, you know, I mean, if, when you get in the kitchen, you, you really, if you got a good crew, you just cut the bullshit and you just put your head down and you do your shit and you do what needs to be done. And, you know, you're, it's it's a team effort. You know, it's we're not there to antagonize somebody. We're there to help help each other because we're all fighting the common war and the common battle and trying to get through the night. Well, exactly. So it's the complete opposite of what you just described on that show. Everyone <laughs> wants to be the leader. Everyone, there's no teamwork. Everyone wants to shine in their own way. 
there is plenty bullshit and plenty arguing, <laughs> and that's why it's been on for 22 yeah. seasons. They, they know right. what they're doing. Right? Yeah, I mean, look at all the events are, that we do for Ignite that, you know, the three of us get together and, you know, all egos are checked. Well, except for Luke's because his shit don't stink because he went to the CIA. CIA. Um, <laughs> Hear this shit, Adam? God damn it. Hey, I'm going to join you because uh, I didn't go to culinary <laughs> school. Not even the yeah. one like in my neighborhood. So you are the big man on campus. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see one stain on your chef jacket. That's not a good sign. Because <laughs> I reserve this one just for the podcast. He's That's a it. company. I have 50 <laughs> of them lined up. Once I get one stain, we just throw it away. We don't even uh, clean. <laughs> and it's usually just a coffee stain too. Oh man, you guys! It's a Taco Bell <laughs> stain from lunch. <laughs> <laughs> a hot sauce packet fell out. No, no, just, I, don't, just, I only wear the gray chef coats for that. Just strap the chef coat to the mop, and we'll just save ourselves on the mop stain. We don't need to wear it. One time is good. <laughs> Nice. I can't so, say shit though. My employees, we all wear t-shirts, so we have yeah. no, uh, no ranking system by us, but a lot of my business right. now is Robert probably knows is a lot of private chef work and corporate stuff, whether it's bucks or brewers or, um, you know, corporations will come in and want their team building or have people do stuff together. But I'm usually in someone's house once or twice a week and doing mm -hmm. cool experiences and stuff that I can change up the menu all the time. And they that's, want something awesome. very specific or they, they want to change it up. Like my Instagram shows a lot of that stuff on there and my mm -hmm. highlights and stuff like that, which I'm just fortunate to do that. Um, I don't need to work like the fast casual pasta spot is awesome, but they don't want me there. They get <laughs> mad when I come in. <laughs> But that's good. That's a sign you got a good team that yeah. you know can can roll with it, you know, and, and do what needs to get done. That's, yeah, my older awesome. brother Alex, he is the GM. And then I have honestly, I think I have like I have nine employees. And between the nine employees, there's like it's crazy. There's like 40 years of egg and flour like between them. Like they've all been super loyal and they love it. And they they make really good money, surprisingly, of being a fast casual joint, you know. But with mm -hmm. the money that they make plus tips, there's no servers or anything. It's like you go up to the register and order. They do really mm -hmm. well. And I tell it's like they know that like the nicer they are, the better the food is, the service. They get tipped crazy. So they're making, right. you know, in the mid to high 30s or 20s sometimes just doing that. And they and they're in the they're they're not in a hundred degree kitchen. They get there's music right. playing, you know, they're they get to interact with people. I've had a, the thing that I like the most about is I've had a lot of guys that are girls that come in that are cooks and they really like start to learn how to interact with people and have customer service. So they're kind of getting both ends of it where they're not right. just like stuck in the kitchen. And you know how mm -hmm. us kitchen people are. We're not maybe the best looking or the most uh, mm -hmm. uh, outgoing. We just want to be back there and be unbothered. But they're, right. they really come out of their shell, and I think, like, it helps a lot. And they start getting regulars and, and stuff like that. Like, everyone at my spot does everything, which is, like, a good right. and bad thing. That's cool. That's really cool. There's actually <clears> – <throat> there's a brewery in, Bol uh, yeah, in Boulder, uh, based out of Boulder, called the Mountain Sun. And um, I actually helped open a restaurant just down the alley from their original location at one point. We would trade – you know, trading tacos and stuff for beers, you know, at the, at the end of the day or during lunch or whatever, just for the staff. But that's the way their, their program is. They, I mean, they had people that just rotate around. Um, they had servers, but those servers were also the cooks too. And yeah. it was like, depending on the week, you could be a server this week, but then next week, you know, you're working the grill or the next week you're working the fryer, or, you know, whatever it is, everybody did everything. And that, I was a cool business model. They still do this to this day. Yeah, which is cool. It's like those, that restaurant, like when I started doing my restaurant out of the food hall and then we opened ours, it really boomed during COVID. It was like that fast casual was the cool thing to do. And it's like, hey, not everyone wants to like spend a bunch of money and have to sit down, but they want really good food. So trying to get the, the middle ground of that is like probably the biggest challenge, you know, of like how much can we charge for this? And then what ingredients do we have to use to even fit those margins? You know, right. like for us, everyone's like, oh, pasta is so cheap. You probably make a killing. I'm like, yeah, until you have an employee that costs me 22 bucks an hour to sit there and make all the pasta 
and not <laughs> bring any money back for, you know, she's just prepping right. or we make all the sauces or we're paying really good people to make sure that that, that pasta comes out the right way. So mm-hmm. I love when people are like, oh yeah. Or it's like, even like a really nice pizza spot, like, yeah, pizza is so cheap. I'm like, yeah, until you're buying or are making yeah. your own cheese or you're, you're making right. every, all the ingredients that go on it, or you're having a, a master pizza maker that has to do all the dough and he's in there for, you know, every single day at four in the morning or overnight or whatever. Right. Yeah. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of, a lot of moving pieces. The days of like cheap ingredients or cheap concepts, I think are over. I mean, I just spent, I, I know we keep talking about Taco Bell. I don't know. I maybe I need to go eat that, but I spent 18 <laughs> yeah, for there, today. <laughs> not too long ago. And I'm like, $18 used to fill up a whole, one of the like special right. bags that they have like in reserve <laughs> in the back. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll run that. What's your, what's the favorite food to cook? Start with Robert. <sighs> favorite food to cook. Wow. Just ingredient, how about, that you like to cook with? Man, there isn't, I don't know. It, it changes every day. It changes every week. It changes with the seasons. It changes, I don't know, I, because I don't, because I don't cook every day. I'm doing so many different things that it's like, I, I got really excited the other week when, when we did the burger challenge for marketing. Yeah. And I had to, you know, come up with that Southwestern burger. And so, you know, trying to figure out, okay, yeah, I'm going to mix um, beef with chorizo and, you know, what, you know, what other flavors can I put in there? But I mean, I'm always going to go to something that's like Southeast Asian as long if it's sweet and sour, salty, spicy, if it's got some of that stuff going on, some ferment, it's like, um, I'm all in. Yeah. I'd say for me, it's more of above all else. I love like a braise, right? Anything yeah. that I can do that's like that, just because I like the the attention to detail. You know the you know becoming one with those ingredients in in that sauce and everything that's that's happening with that product. But I think Latin foods for me would probably be where I would go to, but just because there's there's so many different possibilities. I mean, we opened this restaurant a while back. Uh, it was all Latin foods, but you know that's all of South America. It's Spain. It's you know uh, uh, in the you know tropical regions as well as other places too. So it, the influence is kind of I don't know. It's just a whole you know bunch of different worlds kind of smacked together. It gives you a lot of a lot of places to go. Yeah, the melting pot with that. Mm-hmm. How about for you, Ryan, Adam? Well, I was going to go to Ryan first, I guess. Okay. All right. Meet. Anything meat, I love cooking meat. I love yeah. smoking it. I love sous viding it. I love doing anything with it from like, I don't know, pork to lamb to all that type of stuff. I just, I don't know why. I just always have, my dad was a big griller when I was growing up and stuff. So I was always kind of like, well, that's cool. And then he would be like, I don't know. Like I was watching this cooking show and this guy made a smoker out of um, pots, like planting pots. Sure. And so instead of going to buying a smoker, I'd come home in the driveway and he would have like 40 gallon planting pots made a smoker out of it with like wooden <laughs> shit. And I'm that's like, awesome. that's cool. <laughs> yeah. A little different than the CIA training. Yeah. yeah. Just a touch. <laughs> 100%. No, I get, th- I get that too. Cause I feel like with the meat, like everyone's like, oh, I can cook a great steak. Or you go to like great steak houses are super well known and you're like, and that's not what I was expecting. I was expecting more, mm-hmm. but it's like, mm-hmm. there's so much stuff you can do with it and techniques and different stages of marinating or the sous vide or dry rubs or whatever, where I'm surprised so many places when you see like a video or a documentary, they're like, yeah, we just put salt and pepper on it and on the grill. And I'm like, there is so much more you can do so much. Right. More. And it's not <laughs> like to so change the flavor of the meat. It's to like, give it something because if you think about it, even the prime or the stuff that's really fatty or whatever, it still needs help. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I love that. It's, and it's, I like going to like um, the grocery store too, and just getting like six different meat seasonings. Yeah. And mixing them together. Exactly. Like, and then adding other stuff to it, like making mm-hmm. it like your own rub. Well, and so like, everyone goes like, oh, what did you season those steaks with? I'm like, just uh, for you guys, just 
your whole seasoning cabinet just rip that down equal parts yeah. everything <laughs> just go for exactly. it exactly <laughs> like it's not it's not it's there's not a special way to follow or whatever i just say do equal amounts of everything and you should be pretty yep. good yeah, yeah right. exactly. But yeah, for me, it's it was always like steaks. Obviously, pasta is my jam. I like it because I like learning new things because I know not every chef, even if they're really, really high-end cookie or whatever, I still see some chefs like really struggle making pasta. And that's kind of like my thing where I'm like, yes, like I can do that. And obviously, there's tons of things that I don't know or I, I would totally fuck up in their world. But I feel like pasta is just so satisfying. And like it goes, you can make like, even a pretty shitty sauce. And if you have fresh pasta, you're like, okay, it's fine. It's just like a yes. different <laughs> technique and, and texture to it where it's just so different or like stuffed pasta is like my favorite thing. And then I would say like steaks for sure. Like I'm kind of in your realm where it's like, not only is it like a show stopping thing, but it can uh-huh. go in so many directions. Every culture, every cuisine uses protein, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just easy to change things up by just the seasoning or the way that you cook it. I really like doing like open flame or grilling or stuff like that. But then I also like doing, you know, the really delicate stuff like Lucas or maybe you sous vide and then you're just kind of like rolling it over one of the, like a small like grill or sign or, or even like cooking meat on like the flat top or the plancha where it's not, there's no flame at all, but it's, it's set up like that. I mean, I just like food that like, it doesn't have to be, sorry, this is not directed towards your hour, but I don't need the gels and the foams and all that. I love the experience, (laughs) but I like to eat like what it says on the menu and it comes in front of me and I see it and I know what it is. And it just tastes like the best it possibly can. Uh Yeah. That's kind of how I cook. That's like my cooking style. I would say is like people ask, I'm just like, I just want to cook food. That's it's, it's prepared how it's meant to. It's in season mm-hmm. and it goes well with the other flavors, you know, and it's not yeah. over or under and it's, you know, we're not changing too much about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. you know, and all well noted. Um, and <laughs> Rob, all well noted. <laughs> He's like, I love, I love pork chop gel. I geek out on the food science, but you know, so like, you know, th- the um, the restaurant um, Barrio Cafe, it unfortunately just closed here after 23 mm-hmm. years of being open. And I've taken these guys there many times to eat. And the Cochinita Pibil, which is wrapped in banana leaf and smoked all night long, did I tried to replicate that and came pretty fucking close to it um, nice. the other day in, in our smoker oven here in the kitchen. And, you know, I mean, so there was, there were no tweezers. There was no, I didn't pull out any hydrocolloids or anything like that. Um, he did but, all that stuff when nobody was looking. <laughs> yeah, we can see you. the beakers behind you, Robert. <laughs> yeah. We can see your kimchi shit like, behind you, dude. What's that vial of green liquid behind you? <laughs> <laughs> now I feel so much like Luke. <laughs> yeah, right? About time. Somebody else shared a bit of this burden. <laughs> is that a robot behind happened? you, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm actually controlling all the equipment with mind thought right now. There yeah. we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's it like? What's the difference between a brick and mortar and a uh, food food hall, Adam? So, for me, it's you're unless you own the food hall, which is usually never the case. Um, mm-hmm. You're on their terms. So like the general eating area or, you know, the dining room of where the guests can go and come together, that's on them, how they design it, the hours of operation, the kitchen, usually the kitchen equipment. Um, Some food halls are different. You have all your cooking equipment and prep you do right in your space. Some there's a commissary kitchen and then you're everyone's sharing the back. So it's like dealing with that and dealing with people using your stuff or you just come in the next day and you can't find a microplane or whatever it is. Um, A brick and mortar, so much more control. You can change the menu every now and then. What's one thing I didn't get to is in the food hall too, is like we had a thing where they didn't want the food crossing over. So like Mm -hmm. they didn't want three places serving a burger. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, so it's like, it's very tough. For someone that, like, especially like me, you know me, Robert, like, I might have an idea and the next day I just want to do it. Even though it didn't have yeah. to do with pasta, it's like, hey, let's do a burger that has fettuccine Alfredo on top and just smash it or whatever. I couldn't do those things. So having a brick and mortar is like controlling things like holidays being off, 
closing early because there's a snowstorm and you just feel bad for your staff or you want to make sure that they're safe and they want to get home holiday stuff, big stretches like that. If it's someone's mm-hmm. birthday, it's like, Hey, you can have off. Like you can be open or closed whenever that's a huge thing, but then controlling your own vibe and your own concept and your own culture, you know, is like a huge thing, you know, like not having a booth next to yours where the person's like on their phone or sleeping, waiting for someone to come up to the register and order food, even though it's not our business or anything, <laughs> but it's like, yeah. Hey, and it, you're, you're fucking us over by like not having a good experience as a whole. Or what if someone mm-hmm. comes into the food hall and doesn't want pasta that day and they try the burger and the, the customer service was awful. The burger sucked. It was overcooked. They're like, that they might not even come, come back, back to the food hall in general, even though your shit is completely different and bang and they could care less because that one experience or big thing that I always talked about with my staff is like the bathrooms, you know, or, or <laughs> just general areas where that people would gather is like, you can control all of that. Mm-hmm. So having the brick and mortar, even though it's fast casual, we do so much cool stuff where we're putting up artwork, uh, times of operation. I just actually bought uh, we have a Street Fighter Two arcade game in the restaurant, oh, nice. and I just nice. got the Simpsons four player arcade game that is on the <laughs> oh, way. That's awesome! And we're putting that in, and they're all free and everything. People just like to go play, and while they're waiting for their food, or just hanging out. And uh, that's a good. It's idea. like stuff like that, you know, where it fits your brand, it fits your concept, and it's nice to be able to change things up all the time. Mm-hmm. You just have more control, you know, and you're not Robert. You're not sending all your money away to the owner of the food hall. It's all going <laughs> mm-hmm. to yourself, which is nice. Yeah, yeah right. and your staff, and yep, yep. You're, you, you, you got because those are usually based on percentages, and it's like, wait, I'm getting punished that I'm doing really good this month. Like, what the <laughs> fuck? Yeah, <right? laughs> there was no point to you, there was no drive or inspiration to take a catering order to like do a special thing because you're you're making the same amount. You're just mm-hmm. making more of it, you know, and you're like, you know, it's like, why would I have a special chef come in and do an event for the day where he does his pasta of the day, which we have done because in the beginning that was a big drive. But as you know, two years, three years go on, it's like, okay, I want an extra two grand this week to like help out for pay for something or whatever. Well, I have an event and then 30 more percent or 25 or it's still going to that landlord. Regardless, you're never getting ahead. Mm-hmm. So at a brick and mortar, we could have a buyout on a Wednesday and be like, all right, this week we made three grand more and it doesn't matter because all of our fixed costs are the same. And we really did get that extra bump. Nice. So that's a really important thing too, that like food halls are great. They were all the rage. I would say, you know, five years ago, six years ago, Mm -hmm. they were really, really going crazy all over, which the really big cities and the big ones where they have really nice places, I think they still do well and they thrive and they have a purpose and it's, it's cool. But uh, there's nothing better than being able to just like unlock the front door of your own place, you know, or yeah. go in there when you're closed and you're not and no one's there and you're unbothered. Like there's just something about that um, or being able to just control your own space. Right. Oh, he woke up. He's been sleeping for 59 yeah. minutes. He's doing really oh, good. good. Say hello. <laughs> hey. Oh, there you go. hey, buddy. What else do you have for us, Robert? You have some some uh, you want to do like a. Uh, you know, firing questions or anything like that. I don't know what you guys do here. What weird things? Everyone still has their clothes on. This is this is what we do. This is literally what we do. We talked about Gordon Ramsay. Then tell us about Bobby Flay. Mm. Oh yeah, I saw that. Well, there was so there was one in between that everyone forgets, which is fine. But I okay. won ten grand the Super Chef Grudge Match one, which was oh, really nice. cool too. That was a uh, a new show. It was the first season, but that was. Uh, with Declan from Hell's Kitchen, so the big Irish guy I got to cook against him. I ended up winning ten grand, and I have his knife. So that was a good nice. show yeah, cool. um, and fun. But yeah, Bobby Flay was one of the ones that's kind of in the same realm as Hell's Kitchen. It's like everyone's seen it at least once before. It's kind mm-hmm. of like iconic in the uh, competition world. It like fits in that chopped or whatever, you know, uh-huh. where it's like, yeah, I would do that because it's just classic, you know, and. Uh, it was exactly how I thought, you know, the set and there was no script and there's no bullshit. They take really good care of you. They have all the, everything that you could possibly want. And it was real quick. It's a one day thing. We filmed that in, uh, in New York wow. 
And uh, he was super nice. And I had, uh, for people that didn't see the episode, Chris Red from SNL and Michael Simon were my judges oh, slash nice. like helpers to get me to beat him. So <clears throat> Cleveland Midwest guy, super, super nice. And uh, it was more intense doing the first round because you mm-hmm. obviously didn't know what the ingredient is or whatever. And you don't know who the guy next to you or the girl next to you is or where they're from or their experience or whatever. So it's kind of different, you know, at least with, if you get to the second round, you know what you're going to cook and you're like, all right, it's Bobby Flay. He's just going to do something pretty decent, you know? Mm -hmm. But yeah. So the first round, uh, he pulls out red onion. And I, at first I was just like, oh shit. And it's literally like 45 seconds to a minute when he shows you the ingredient and when he rings the bell and you start cooking. So it's real, really not scripted. They don't tell you the ingredient before you show up or anything, which is cool. Cause I think they'll make better dishes too like that, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. But he pulls fucking a red onion out behind him. And at first I was just like, there's no way. Cause it's 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. It's not like you have 40, 45 minutes cooking. Something is so right. much different than 20. It's uh-huh. like by the time you need to get your pans hot and you're plating, you're down to 10 minutes essentially. Yeah. So Jesus. I did the uh, I did the French onion soup bucatini, which I've done as a special. So good thing I, I fucking take part in the 420 community and come up with dumb <laughs> ideas to put with pasta <laughs> because it saved my ass. Because I was like, all right, onion. And really what came of it is I saw a big cast iron on the stove that was already set up there. I was like, I oh, know I'll do something with that. Uh-huh. And then I saw they had bucatini and like this um, – it looked like a flower base, whatever. And I was like, all right, let's just go. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, caramelize the onions as much as possible and build French onions super quick and make pasta. And who doesn't love pasta? That's the thing. Yeah. It's like, you could, if, if you would have said tomatoes, a good part of me probably would have made some sort of pasta. Or like you think of these ingredients, you know, as long as it's not, I was just hoping it wasn't like pineapple or mango or some shit like that, you know, cause uh-huh. that was the one thing I watched so many episodes and like, there, you have a chance to get the worst shit ever. Mm-hmm. Like where he's like, all right, grapes. And I'm like, uh, you know, what do you, what do you do? <laughs> you know, it's tough <laughs> to make it the star, not only just use it, but to make it like the star mm-hmm. of the, of the dish. Right. That's the thing. And then getting to him, they, they sent me through and then getting to him, you get to know what your dish is and they have everything ready for you and they have it placed or right, easy to get to. And that's when you're mm-hmm. like, they want you to open up as a chef and show your personality because You've cooked, you're supposed to, you know, cook this dish a hundred times, you know, mm-hmm. or it's like from your menu or whatever, or, or it's something that you like to cook at home and have fun with it and mess with the judges and kind of talk shit to Bobby and everything. And then, you know, it's all in those producers' hands. You hear, I didn't say judges' hands. It's all in those producers' yeah. hands. <laughs> Who knows? I have no idea. No one ever knows how that goes. But if any of you guys saw it, I feel like I did fucking really good and his yep. steak was trash and my potatoes were not as good as his apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you need you know what you need to work on for next time then, better potatoes yeah. and yep. better steak. <laughs> and now I have to live with that every time I see someone they're like, "Oh no, we don't want you making potatoes for us." I'm like, "Jesus <laughs> Christ. It's not that serious, all right?" Well, <laughs> We'll do a second podcast with you and let you redeem yourself with potatoes. It'll just be you cooking potatoes. Hey, the next time that we do this, I'm going to be in my white chef jacket at the restaurant and I'm going to show everyone that I actually am cooking. It's just going to be two hours of you cooking potatoes. <laughs> yeah, all different kinds. Just all, all different, right? different kinds. <laughs> hey, there's a, there's a TikTok out there that's actually pretty cool to watch. This guy does all things potatoes, and he does shit that I didn't even know existed in the potato world. I can believe that. Do you know, I think it's Peru has like 4,000 different mm-hmm. types of potatoes that grow out there. Yeah. It's a lot. Isn't that yeah. crazy? Yeah. I mean, I'm just curious when there's that many is like, do they all taste really good? Or is the guy talking about the 4,000 different kinds? Is he just like trying to like make it seem really good? Or there's some that just taste like complete shit. Yeah. Just, yeah. They 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 just taste like garbage. There's gotta be some, right? I mean, I love potatoes, but there's gotta be something that just tastes awful. Has to be. I think a big part of it too, is that Peru has so many different uh, microclimates throughout the entire country mm. that you've got you've got 
you know, snowy peaks you've got down by the ocean. So, you know, everything's just growing in a different zone. So that's, you know, you've got. Now that's a CIA answer right here. there. Yeah. Okay, Robert, here we go with your chemistry. I didn't even set. have to say it. <laughs> all right. All right. He's like, well, when you take your private helicopter up to the top of the mountain. Right and then when you take your yacht to the ocean side, there's potatoes down there. We know how you roll, Robert. It's, it's good to be the corporate chef. <laughs> We're not letting you educate anyone on this podcast. We don't want any real information going out to people. What are you doing? How dare you do talk about something actually informational here <laughs> <laughs> okay so since you opened the door this will fall right into it and i'm opening myself up to major ridicule oh god my wife books all of our she books all of our trips so we go to turkey and she did it through a travel agent and our um tour guide picks us up at our hotel in turkey um we're in the new part of istanbul at this time and we're supposed to go on a cruise of the Bosporus. And I've seen all these big cruise boats and, you know, you got all these people hanging off of it. And so we're walking and we're walking, we walk past the big boat and there's, I see in the distance, like this 70 foot yacht and we keep getting closer to it and closer to it. And I'm like, well, where the fuck are all the rest of the people? My wife booked us on a private 70 foot yacht to cruise the Bosphorus for two hours. Oh, Jesus Christ. I wasn't even wrong. <laughs> you weren't wrong. <laughs> I'm out of here. I'm out of yeah. here. This is my two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, he said wife, but he met Ignite, booked him the yeah. private yeah. yacht. <laughs> good, good wordplay, Robert. Carl's going to go play. back and edit my American Express now. Come on. I think he's here. Blame on the back of this boat. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so did, did they have like a chef for you and everything like set up for you? Or was it like a captain and then they just toured you around? It was, no, it was a captain and two other people. And so it was me, my wife, and our tour guide and um, a bottle of champagne. That's sweet. No food or anything? They didn't like do no. have that set up? No, because we... We had a private lunch at the uh, oldest restaurant in Istanbul for, we go. after that. Yeah. With the prime <laughs> minister. <laughs> with the prime yeah, with minister. The, prime minister. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the travel agency is like, yeah, we booked this great adventure. It's going to be like 150 grand for one day. <laughs> Are you in? <laughs> and then it's 250 grand per hour after that <laughs> and his wife's like joe trust me this is really good experience just trust me on this one. <laughs> but the receipt just says turkey so you can write it off <laughs> you just put that on the work card robert come on now <laughs> That does sound like that does sound legit. Like I'm, I've never, obviously I've never been there before. The only time I've been out of the Same. country, I went to Colombia, and there was no helicopters or yachts or anything like that. Um, really good views and like everything, but obviously um, I'm working on that. I'm supposed to be going to Italy this year. So in September, nice, October, nice. that's the, to go visit my uh, family's actual house that they grew up in. So uh -huh. I still have family that live in uh, <laughs> Sicily. Awesome. So you're going down That's south cool. then. Nice. Yeah. 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 I kind of want to do the like, no tourist thing. Just go down there. My buddy that li lives here is a hundred percent Sicilian. He has a house down there that he doesn't use like unless he's there. So we wanted to go down there and he has some friends that own restaurants and he's like, I'm like, yeah, that's called a stash. He's like, no, they're just going to let you do whatever. I'm like, okay. Yeah. You know, cool. but just, just <laughs> watching, you know how we are yeah. like, as a chef, yeah. if you go into a restaurant and you're sitting in the kitchen for an hour or two, you pretty much know the whole menu. You yeah. know, yeah. once you <laughs> yeah. see it, you're just like, wow, okay, why are they using that? Or this is the stage that they're doing it. Or you just get, I get so inspired by just watching other chefs cook where I don't need a whole day or week to be in the kitchen to learn everything, you know, which is kind of cool. You know, I guess it depends on the level of chef that you are, you know, of how you pick it up, if you're going to be like a sponge or if you actually have to do it. But that's what I'm excited about. So if you guys ever need someone to come watch you cook, I'll steal all your cool <laughs> ideas. I'm down. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and I'll bring the dog. It'll it'll be yeah, there, you go. Oh, there we go. That may there be a, go. a requirement anyway. So. <laughs> so not not everybody knows about Milwaukee and Adam, you 
didn't go to culinary school, but you've cooked your way around Milwaukee. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how, you know, the food scene has changed and some of those mentors that you had. Um, because I know having lived there for almost 30 years, when I got to town, kind of, it was a restaurant desert. It was, you know, yeah. fish fries and German food and, and it's, it's evolved so much. Yeah. The thing that I would say is cool about Milwaukee is a lot of chefs that are really, really successful or no, well known to their restaurants are always busy. Like every night now, they all started at these classic spots and as they were ready to kind of grow and branch out, that's what made the restaurant industry here like really good. It wasn't like people were coming in from other cities and just building like, you know, big restaurants or corporate stuff. You know, you see that every now and then, but we don't really have a lot of that here. We don't have a ton of that Chicago style or New York style, like not chain per se, but, you know, the bigger restaurant groups that come in and just dominate. We don't really have that here. I would say the only there's a, there's maybe one chef that has multiple restaurants, um, but you don't see a lot of it. So it's cool to see the evolution. Like, hey, they were the chef of a well-known restaurant. Then they were ready. Their sous chef moved into that and then they opened their own. So now we have another new restaurant here. But it all is still within the same realms, which like some people would say it's bad, but it's also good because then you're seeing like their own style, their own way of how they uh, do their dining room, how they design their kitchen, how their hours about like everything that they do is really cool to see that. But then you have a lot of people that want to open restaurants that are doing it with like super small budgets or they're taking it right down to the end. And it's like. They're making it and they're building into their restaurant as well. You know, we obviously have some of the big guys, the Bartolatas or Adam Siegel with Loopy and Iris and stuff like that, where they're like, hey, we're not opening until every screw is in and every, you know, how it is. But then there's some restaurants out here, which I'm sure it's like them in every city, but it's cool here where they're like, hey, we're opening, but we still need chairs in that section of the dining room and we're getting them next week, but we need to open. Right. You know, so it's right. kind of cool to see the difference, which doesn't make the food any better or any worse, depending how the dining room is. But it's like, I like to see both those worlds. Mm -hmm. But it's really the big thing, I think, is getting more people that live here um, to understand, to try new things. And that between the last three years here, that's really been a huge breakout in Milwaukee is like social media showing restaurants and what they're doing and different weird dishes and stuff like that, or things that are a lot different than what they're used to. They're like, wow, I want to go try that, or I want to go eat that. And then that helps other people say, hey, I'm not scared to open this restaurant because no one's going to come here. I feel like we're kind of getting over that hump of like, Anything's a go, any type of concept will at least get tried or they'll give it a chance. And if it's banging, it's banging. And if not, you know, they're going to go back to their, their regular spots. But they, people have a really good opportunity to do something cool here. And like I said, it doesn't have to be uh, a $5 million restaurant that seats 250 and does, you know, and is doing an open kitchen and everything's insane, you know, with a wine rack and a SOM. It, it doesn't have to be like that. I enjoy that. Um, but I like, we have a lot of those other styles, like I said, where the chef is the owner and the chef is doing everything to get open. And, you know, that's also cool too, to see someone's full vision. Right. I think it's cool when you see the, you know, the, that homegrown kind of cycle of, of restaurants, like you're talking about in, in some of these, you know, smaller markets or, you know, less dense markets, like you're talking about where, you know, those chefs, yeah, they have the opportunity to break out because they have some experience and a little bit of notoriety somewhere. Uh, but then they evolve fairly quickly, too. And they have the freedom to do it because, you know, like back to the brick and mortar conversation, they got their own space. They have the ability to, you know, change and and really come into their own once they get the opportunity to really take the helm. So I, I think that's that's pretty cool about about those markets. I've I've traveled a little bit into Milwaukee. Not that I can really uh, remember names of places that I've been to, but um, I remember having that feeling when I was there, like yeah. you were talking about. There's not, there's not really the, <clears throat> the big chain type places. There's not 
a lot of that. There's just a lot of like this individual, that individual doing this and doing something. Yeah, cool. I mean, for a this city with 630,000 and we only have two really big heavyweight restaurant groups in the whole city, that I mean, that just shows how many, you know, small independent places there are. Um, and Robert knows it would be Benson's, who's the Marcus Corp, which is, you know, a corporation. And then you have uh, Bartolotas that, you know, started from nothing and really just came up. And we know those guys don't mess around. But it's that, to have that, to only have two is pretty cool. And everyone else, like I always tell Robert, I always tell people, like, I have to be one of the last ones that doesn't have his own, you know, fine dining restaurant, which isn't a bad thing. It just yeah. means that everyone here is trying to break out and do their own thing, or they're working at mm-hmm. a restaurant that's super successful. That's packed every night. And they're like, Hey, I'm comfortable with this. This is what I do. I don't need my own restaurant, which is what I always have thought about before too, where it's like, it's not bad that you're not the owner, but if you're the chef, you almost have as much control. You know, you're putting the food out. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, the owner's trusting you. Yeah. I think that's kind of how Denver started off too. When they really got into the cooking world out there, it was like just trying new stuff and opening mm-hmm. up like little private restaurants, nothing like gigantic, but right. it was more people coming out of town, coming into town from different cities doing stuff is I think my opinion when they kind of broke out, which is fine. But I like that idea set that you said, Adam of like, It's people that are in the city doing it themselves. Oh, yeah. It makes it way better because all those people, too, have their own family and followers and all that stuff that actually, like, you know, the what is like the friends and family of the soft openings or whatever. That's super important here. That's like more important than the first week of being open because you really got to just build up that excitement and that like, oh, it's exclusive or it's really good. And that's why, like. I think we did really good with egg and flour at the food hall is that it was so small and it was like so small quantities where it's like people were coming in and it was just the the cool thing. And a lot of social media, Robert can attest that was our thing. Like, Hey, we're on, we're doing a different mm-hmm. special every single day and we're posting about it every single day. And you don't see a ton of that, you know, in, in fast casual, you see that in fine dining where they're showing off dishes or, or really fancy pictures of the food or whatever, but you don't see, you know, Panera and Noodles and Company mm-hmm. and those places posting daily things. They're like, hey, we yeah, are what we not. are. So that was our yeah. thing, and that's what I like about non corporate stuff is that you could do anything. You could you could promote mm-hmm. yourself however you want. Well, and you were a little bit different too. Right in the window, it said F and great pasta. A uh, great F and pasta, <laughs> yes. A oh, great F and pasta, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which we have a giant neon in the brick and mortar now, which is even bigger now, Robert. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Our logo is a, a, what is it called? The uh, the pop-up girl, the, the pin-up girl riding a ravioli uh, cutter. That doesn't quite <laughs> look like a ravioli cutter. <laughs> oh We're God, family awesome. friendly. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you're not getting that past the HR department. <laughs> hey, I am the HR department, Robert. <laughs> you have to take a picture and send it to us. I will. I have it tattooed on my leg, so it's really, uh, yes. really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you look up, uh, like, if you put in, like, egg and flour logo or egg and flour sign on, like, Google or something, that, that logo may come up. That's the original one. But we're just a fun nice. concept that's a lot of neons, pictures. If you guys ever come down, we'll take care of you. Take that yacht down here. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a long, long ride from Turkey, though, I think. Oh yeah, damn it. The Ignite Turkey yacht. I'm, I'm, I'm just not even gonna show up to the next podcast. I'm done. Show up. Yeah, that's what I felt tell like us about last. your five-star vacations that you're taking. <laughs> we're just all jealous. That's why we're that's why we're making fun of you. Exactly. Well, I appreciate you guys having uh, having me on, and I'm glad that I can do a, a podcast that is unscripted and more fun than just the same yeah. old bullshit. People complaining about the same shit and talking about COVID all the time, or mm-hmm. how the industry needs to change. I just like to have fun because we don't get to have fun very often. So, yeah, 
Yeah, right? no, we really appreciate you being on here with appreciate us, Adam, it. and uh, telling everybody a little bit about uh, Milwaukee and egg flour and everything that's going on. And and we got to meet Alfredo. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Hey, and it's it's good timing because Top Chef is in Milwaukee and Wisconsin right now during their season, so you get to see some stuff going on with that yeah. the show. That's been cool. cool to watch. So. Yep. And I'll show him one more time. He's going to be pissed, but. Here we go. Your last moment. Awesome. Let's hope he doesn't take go. a piss. Oh. oh. <laughs> Alfredo. Hey, Alfredo. <laughs> he just wants to sleep. Maybe I will have a, 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 yeah. uh, a child. I just need to find a girl first to make one with. <laughs> <laughs> that all sounds exhausting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it does. <laughs> well, that was fucking awesome yeah <laughs> totally and i hope that doesn't get beeped out but what a good guest yeah i mean he, he's a he's a great guy and i mean you know for somebody who didn't go to the fancy culinary school <clears throat> and <clears throat> uh <laughs> can't beep that out <laughs> so no i mean you know he's he's a great guy he's smart uh he knows you know, he knows food, he gets food, he understands food, he's always learning and, um, and you know, got a, got a good business sense, put, you know, and is willing to take a challenge. I never felt like I ever wanted to be a chef owner. I've always, I just didn't feel like that was in me. And I didn't, um, I didn't, you know, I, kudos to everybody who actually does want to be a chef owner because that's, that's just a whole nother that's level a whole lot of, of, whole lot of work. stuff that you have to do. Right. Yeah. And and just to be a chef owner and become at that level he's at now is mm-hmm. just yeah. the time and effort and the work that he had to put behind that is just crazy. Good well, for multiple him. locations, multiple kind of avenues, you know, I mean like mm-hmm. like he was saying, like he's in somebody's home usually a couple times a week. He's got the restaurant, he's got you yeah. know all this other stuff going on too with the bucks and and whatever else. So, yeah. Well, I don't and know. then that's that makes that's just, you know, being a good manager. I mean, you you set your people up for success so that you can do the next endeavor. Hiring the right people around you. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're I, welcome, I feel, Robert. That's kinda, just what kinda, you did. Kind of like what I did. Yeah. I hired the right guys. You know, I, I, ju- I just sit back and, okay, what are we doing? <laughs> no, this was, this is a good one. Definitely good, 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 uh, good, uh, uh, guest. Last time I did this spin though, my computer flew off the table. Why don't you, why don't you get David just to push you around? I don't know if you're still here. <laughs> Are you guys still here? David? Carl? No, I'm alone. Are you lonely? The story of my life. <laughs> Jesus. All right, I'm just going to go, guys. I'm done. Now I'm sad. Now I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> and now that we've made Ryan sad, take it away, Ryan. Thanks for joining our podcast today. <laughs> Click and subscribe. We. <laughs> that was the lamest shit ever. <laughs> it's kind of like his cooking. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start making more gels for you. <laughs> Do it while you're on the boat. Yeah. Click on it. Subscribe. <laughs> 